Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Cinematic Excrement, the show you're wasting your time with when you really should be doing your household chores. Seriously, when was the last time you dusted? After this video is over, get on that. Today, we are looking at something very special and very stupid, but it's stupid in the best possible ways. It's time for You're the Hunter from the Future. Released in 1983, You're the Hunter from the Future was directed by Italian filmmaker Antonio Margariti and stars legendary B-movie action star Reb Brown, who fans of Mystery Science Theater 3000 might know as Slab Bulkhead, Blast Hard Cheese, Big McLarge Huge, Roll Fizzlebeef, Bob Johnson, oh wait. At the time, Conan the Barbarian had popularized the sword and sorcery genre, and Yor was one of the many films made to capitalize on that. It was not well received and was nominated for three Razzies, though as I have mentioned before, it was not nominated for Worst Picture. The nominations it did receive were Worst New Star for Reb Brown, Worst Original Song, and Worst Musical Score. And I don't know if I agree with the musical nominations in particular. How can you even consider giving a Razzie to this? This is one of the most fist-pumpingly awesome theme songs ever, and I will hear nothing to the contrary. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the song is objectively good. I'm just saying it doesn't have to be good to be awesome. But yeah, it's not good. It's cheesy as hell, the singer sounds like Klaus Mina after a heroin overdose, and the lyrics make very little sense. He never sees the sun? What are you talking about? He's in the sun right now! Good thing, too, as he doesn't have anything else to keep him warm, his outfit leaves little to the imagination, exposing his bulging biceps, pulsing pectorals, and... dead ass. In fact, that's true for pretty much everyone in the movie. It clearly takes place in a time before pants were invented. Wigs had definitely been invented, though. So. Many. Wigs. I couldn't tell you why. It's such a bizarre choice on the part of the filmmakers, especially since they didn't bother to put Brown in a wig for the poster. Also, the poster, and for that matter, the title, totally give away the twist, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I've wanted to cover this movie for a while. It's been on my list for years, ever since, by chance, I found a VHS copy at one of the many video rental stores that were closing down across the country. The label is kind of faded. I don't know if that's going to show up on camera. Maybe if you squint hard enough. But if you look at this close-up photo, you will see that it is, in fact, your. It was an incredible find, especially since I don't think they charged me money for it, they just gave it to me. However, I no longer need this because in the intervening years, we somehow got your on Blu-ray. And of course I have a copy, as we have previously established, I will buy anything. So I don't have to resort to grainy VHS footage for this review. At least, not for the movie, but again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's dive in. After the opening credit sequence where Yor just wanders around aimlessly until his theme song is over, we're introduced to a young woman named Kala, played by Corinne Clary, and an old dude named Pag, played by Luciano Pigozzi, but credited under his stage name, Alan Collins. He appears to be the only member of the cast not wearing a wig, and, ironically, the only one who needs to. They're attacked by a weird combination of a stegosaurus and a triceratops, but a blonde man with a mysterious medallion shows up out of nowhere and leaps into action. As you can tell, the budget for this movie was not very high, but considering what they had to work with, I suppose the puppet isn't terrible. The action sequence, however, is. I'm gonna jump over this beast's head for no reason. Whee! After slaying this dinosaur hybrid, Yor starts drinking its blood? Ew. <laughs> It burns like fire. The blood of your enemy makes you stronger. What if your enemy has AIDS? As you can probably tell from that bit of dialogue, the actors have been dubbed. The majority of the cast was French, Italian, or Turkish, and many spoke little or no English, so I suppose looping them in post was inevitable. But the weird thing is, Red Brown speaks English. He was born in LA. But for reasons I cannot explain, they also looped him. That's not his voice. You know how I know? Here's his reaction after slaying the Tri-Stegotops or whatever the hell. That is not a Red Brown scream. Now that's the genuine article, and it's a crime that we don't get to hear it in this movie. The dubbed dialogue does lead to some unintentionally funny moments, like yours reaction to Kala performing a sultry dance number. 
Good. That is obviously not what he said there. In fact, according to Brown himself, that was supposed to be a burp. While they feast on the Stegotrisaurus, a group of hairy blue men attack the tribe. Yor does his best to fight off the blue bastards, but in the process, he accidentally burns down the village and possibly one of the cameras. Several women are captured, including Kala, and in the process of trying to rescue her, Yor gets thrown off a fucking cliff. He survives this fall with barely a scratch, which... how? One of the blue men falls off the same cliff after Pag shoots him with an arrow. He is lethal with that bow, by the way. And that guy falls to his death. Yor just takes a quick nap at the bottom of the cliff, and he's good to climb back up. Clearly, his theme song does not lie. He's the man. Brown performed all of his own stunts in this movie, including this rock climb, which was probably a bad idea in hindsight. Apparently, he got stuck halfway up and they had to rescue him. He also caught dysentery during the shoot and lost about 25 pounds, which is why his appearance sometimes changes between shots. I am amazed that man is still alive after making this movie. Clearly, he is made of sterner stuff. Anyway, Yor reunites with Pag, who actually tries to stop him from rescuing Kala, because the Blue Men won her in battle, and apparently, under caveman law, women are subject to a Finder's Keepers clause. No, Pag. I don't recognize your laws. That way. Well, that didn't take much convincing. Who knew that all it took to avoid following the law was to simply proclaim, I don't recognize your laws. Usually that only works if you're rich. They track the Blue Men to their cave, and Yor shoots and kills some kind of giant bat-like creature. And what follows is somehow simultaneously the dumbest and coolest goddamn thing ever. Perfect. No notes. Yor ends up flooding the cave, drowning the blue men and possibly the captured women as well? We don't actually see them drown, but we don't see them escape either. The bridges were washed away, so at best, they're trapped in there, unless they can swim, so... I don't know. Yor may very well have let some innocent women drown and committed genocide on the Blue Cavemen. Our hero, ladies and gentlemen. Why is Yor so different from other men? Steroids, I expect. At some point, Yor decides to wander off on his own and runs into a tribe of fire-wielding mummies who are protecting slash holding hostage a woman named Roa. Like Yor, she's one of the few people on Earth who has blonde hair, and they're wearing the exact same medallion. Isn't that interesting? Where'd you get that medallion? From the same middle school shop class as you. The rest of Roa's people are frozen in ice, which she somehow survived, and there are hints that the mummies are suffering from radiation poisoning. More on that later. Yor swipes their flaming sword and easily wipes them out, making this his second genocide in as many days. That brings up an interesting point. We've seen the sun go down and come back up, which means Yor and his friends have been going strong for a full day. And in that time, they've had one meal and, at least in Yor's case, a quick nap. And that's it. They gotta be running on fumes at this point. But of course, that doesn't bother Yor, because he's the man. And the cave collapses, because... Actually, I have no idea. It just does. And now Yor has himself a blonde and a brunette, which doesn't sit well with Kala, as she's not the sharing type. And she straight up tries to cut a bitch. Their catfight is interrupted by the blue men, who apparently did not all die, but Yor and Pag leap into action. I say again, Pag is lethal with that bow. And Yor finishes off their leader. Damn you, Khan. Wait, what did he say? Damn you, Khan. Oh, his name is Ukon. Okay, I must have missed that. For a second, I thought he called him a... well... Never mind. Unfortunately, Roa is mortally wounded during the battle, which Kala is very sad about. Didn't she just try to kill her a minute ago? Girl, make up your mind! After saving another group of people from a cheap dinosaur puppet, yes, the movie is already repeating itself, Yor and company end up at a seaside village when... this happens. <laughs> Remember how this movie is called You're the Hunter from the Future? And we have people affected by radiation? Well, here's the big twist. We're not on prehistoric Earth. Yours world is actually a post-apocalyptic future Earth, and his parents were among a small group of survivors of a nuclear war. I'm... 
Not exactly sure how this led to dinosaurs coming back, but honestly, that's the least of this movie's problems. Anyway, the village is attacked by spaceships, which they don't have the budget to show on camera, so you're just gonna have to trust that they're there. Yor goes after them, and this is where the movie goes from sword and sorcery to a cheap Star Wars knockoff. There's a human-like race of blonde people led by the Emperor, I mean the Overlord. He shoots light from his hands. Not lightning, but close enough. There's an underground resistance movement, and he has a bunch of androids that... Well, you can see what they look like. Come on, Margariti, you're not even being subtle here, man. I think George Lucas gonna sue somebody. The Overlord intends to repopulate the world with his race of androids, but as you can see, they're a bit fragile. So he intends to create new androids from the DNA of Yor and Kala, who he calls a genetically perfect woman. Whatever that means. And if you're wondering why the Overlord wants to use Yor and Kala to create a race of ugly-ass androids instead of just regular people, since they're genetically perfect and all. Well, so am I. The movie doesn't even try to make sense of the Overlord's idea of a master race. He's like a Nazi, but stupid. He's like a Nazi. Yor and company join the Resistance and somehow end up in a funhouse mirror maze, which they easily escape a minute later. Well, that was pointless. And then they end up on the set of Space Mutiny? I mean, I doubt it's the same location. This was mostly filmed in Turkey, and Space Mutiny was shot in South Africa. But the resemblance is uncanny. Roll, blast face, buff, speed run. And Pag, who was previously lethal with a bow, is now lethal with a laser rifle, a weapon he's never seen before. Pag is seriously the unsung hero of this movie. His body count may not be as high as yours, but between the bow and the blaster, he has more than done his part. And that's not all. Remember your hang gliding on that dead bat thing? Well, Pag also gets his moment of glorious insanity. Yor plants a bomb on the Overlord's ship so he can commit his third genocide, but now he's trapped on the other side of this chasm. He tells everyone to run for it, but Pag isn't about to let his friend die. And what follows goes beyond the wire jump of doom. Pag does an impossible backflip, he and Yor briefly turn into action figures, and they swing to safety. I still can't help but laugh when I watch that sequence. It's amazing. And Yor and the Rebels pile into a spaceship, and they fly to safety as the Overlord's plans go up in flames. Yor returns to the primitive tribes on the mainland. He has a spaceship, and he's just going back to the cavemen? Talk about a lack of ambition. He is determined to use his superior knowledge to prevent them making the same mistakes as their forefathers. Whoa, whoa, hold up. Superior knowledge? You realize we're talking about a guy who thinks you can become stronger by drinking blood. Will he succeed? If you have to ask. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the beautiful disaster that is your The Hunter from the Future. The acting, or rather the voice acting, is hit and miss, the costumes and wigs are cheap as hell, the story makes very little sense, and the action sequences are incredibly goofy. Almost everything about it is wrong. And that's why it's awesome. This is one of my all-time favorite bad movies. It's just plain fun to watch. And it seems like the cast mostly had fun making it, though I'm sure Reb Brown would have been happier had he not caught dysentery. Even Margariti described it as a fun project made with zero budget. He knew he wasn't making a masterpiece, and he seemed to get a kick out of the movie's critical reception. But how exactly did this movie get made? Where did this bonker story come from? Well, believe it or not, this story that brought together people from Italy, France, Turkey, and the United States began in South America. The opening credits mention the movie was based on a novel called Yor, though it was originally a comic series by Juan Zanotto. Born in Italy, his family emigrated to Argentina in 1948, and years later he started working as a comic book artist. In 1974, along with Eugenio Zapietro, who worked under the pseudonym Ray Collins, he created Enga el Cazador or Enga the Hunter, for the inaugural issue of comic anthology magazine Scorpio. The series was successful, running monthly in Scorpio for a little over four years. The magazine eventually made its way to Italy, where Enga was renamed Yor. I'm not entirely sure why. In later issues of Scorpio, Enga's son Or was introduced. Maybe the names were conflated and the H turned into a Y? I don't know. In any case, the story was discovered by Margariti, who found it fascinating, and decided to turn it into a movie. Oh, did I say movie? I meant to say TV miniseries. No, for real. 
While a theatrical version was also released in Italy, Yor was actually shot as a four-part miniseries for Italian TV under the title Il Mondo di Yor, or Yor's World. Well, at least part of the theme song makes sense now. The total runtime for the miniseries is, I shit you not, about three and a half hours. It's closer to three hours of actual footage if you skip the credits and episode recaps, but that's still more than twice the runtime of the American theatrical cut. Some scenes from the movie are extended, and some scenes in the miniseries aren't present in the movie at all. I did manage to find a subtitled copy of the TV version of Yor through <clears throat> alternate means, and if you're wondering what you're missing if you've only seen the theatrical cut, the answer is... not much. There are a few moments I found interesting that weren't in the movie. There's a sequence where Yor fights what appears to be a Dianoga, as if the movie wasn't already ripping off Star Wars enough, and after the heroes reach the seaside village, Yor and Kala are apparently married. There's also a weird moment after Yor kills the second dinosaur and Kala offers him some of the beast's blood. Il sangue dell'animale ti renderà più forte. <laughs> Ma non il sangue di questo. Oh, so that dino does have AIDS. But almost all of the additional footage is pure filler with characters performing mundane tasks, navigating obstacles, or just wandering aimlessly. So. Much. Aimless. Wandering. It has no bearing on the plot and serves no purpose apart from padding the runtime. And this makes me wonder if the miniseries was actually the original plan. Red Brown mentioned in the Blu-ray commentary that the shoot was extended at some point and lasted much longer than he originally signed on for. I can't help but wonder if a 90-minute movie was the original goal, but then they got the TV deal and had to hastily rewrite the script to drag this sumbitch out to three hours. I don't know for a fact that's what happened, but it would explain a thing or two. You might also be wondering how faithful Margariti was to the source material. Well, it's actually pretty close. Up to a certain point. Keep in mind, mi espanol es muy mal, so if I screw up a few details here and there, lo siento. But from what I can gather, the movie starts off following the first few issues of the comics, more or less. I do note that Pag in the comics looks more like some kind of goblin than a human, and when Ukon and the Blue Men chuck Yor off the cliff, we actually see a tree break his fall, which makes it much more likely that he would have survived. Actually, now that I see this, I think that is what happens in the movie as well. They just did a really shitty job of shooting it. Had I not seen the comic, I never would have known that was the intent. The comic also makes it clear that Yor did rescue the other women taken captive by the Blue Men, so I guess he's slightly less of an asshole than I thought. But the movie drastically departs from the comics after the seaside village is attacked. I mean, that goes without saying. The comic couldn't have ripped off Star Wars. It was 1974. There was no Star Wars. After Yor runs into a tribe of Amazons who basically use him as breeding stock before trying to kill him, if I had a nickel, the story takes a sci-fi turn, somewhat like the movie. But in this version, Yor discovers he is a descendant from the lost city of Atlantis, a colony established by an alien race that came to Earth from Mars, and his name is actually Gahalid. The Atlanteans plan to act as missionaries of sorts, helping advance society and technology on Earth. Unlike the movie, this is not a post-apocalyptic Earth, as the Atlanteans refer to ancient Egypt and Sumeria as civilizations they plan to build in the future. Their colony's supreme leader is preparing for war with the Motherland, but Yor finds a group of rebels that want no part of the war, thank you very much, and are planning to escape. There's no mention of androids as far as I can tell, but there is a volcanic eruption that destroys the Atlantean colony and, somewhat like the movie, Yor and the rebels hijack a ship and get the hell out just before everything goes kaboom. And that's the story of Yor, or Enga, or Gehalid, whatever. The comics continue on from there, but that's the part of the story that the filmmakers used as the basis of the movie. It's interesting to see just how closely Margariti stuck to the original story up until he didn't, and he made a hard turn just to capitalize on the popularity of Star Wars. And I'm not sure he had to do that. Granted, some of this stuff probably would have been expensive to shoot, but they managed to keep your fighting dinosaurs and sea monsters within the budget. It looked cheap as hell, sure, but they did it. Surely they could have found a way. On the other hand, hearing the Atlantean Supreme Leader talk about war and then never actually seeing it would have been an anticlimactic finish. Still, the Star Wars ripoff seemed like a cheap way out. That said, Yor the Hunter from the Future is still very entertaining. You can skip the TV version, but the theatrical cut is awesome. It's cheap and silly, but it's fun. Set your expectations accordingly, and enjoy. Next time, we're going to... Oh. 
Oh. Well, I see the Razzies have given out another batch of awards. My break from reviewing the worst picture winners was fun while it lasted. Let's see who they selected this time. Oh. Oh. Oh, bother. We'll need a lot more hemp before we're through. 